Do something good, Mike. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Asia, very much for those comments. Thank you for your leadership, for raising all of our game. Uh, thank you, our Axios colleague, Jimmy Shelton, who put together that amazing video. So I was wasting time in the newsroom of the Richmond Times-Dispatch. I'd filed my story, and I was talking to the night police reporter, Mark Smith. Those of you who've worked in local news know that in an old school TV newsroom, newspaper newsroom, the biggest stories in local news are, one, when snow is coming, even a couple inches, and people go and buy milk and toilet paper, and second, when the Powerball gets big. So this particular day, the Powerball was about to set a record. And Mark and I were debating if we would quit if we won. And the courts reporter, Tom Campbell, was sitting over there. We didn't even know that he was listening, but he was typing away on his ATEX terminal. Gil Klein will remember ATEX. He's typing away on his ATEX terminal. And he looked up and he said, if I won the Powerball, I'd still work here but I'd take a lot less shit. And he went back to typing <laughs> his story. And that's journalism, right? It's important and it's hard, but we do it because we love it. We feel a calling. And there are very few jobs like that, and we feel privileged to have one of them. Whether you're an intern or the boss, we're always just the steward for our role till the time comes to pass the torch. The big picture. This is a moment of trial for the profession and for many of our colleagues personally. They feel attacked and threatened. There's never been a more important time for clear-eyed, courageous journalism and relentless pursuit of truth. Thank you to the National Press Club for this Fourth Estate Award and for supporting the Journalism Institute, which equips the next generation of journalists to inform the public through our precious free press. Support journalism, support democracy, I'm told. Our huge appreciation of the Press Club president, Emily Wilkins of CNBC, thank you for a great night. And to her predecessor, Eileen O'Reilly, Axios Managing Editor of Standards and Training, has helped make Axios what it is. Eileen, to us, you will always be Madam President. Thank you. Thank you to all our hardworking Axios colleagues who believed in Axios, took a chance, and worked wisely and tirelessly on behalf of the company and our audience. We're privileged that a bunch of them are here. This is dedicated to you. We're grateful to you. Thank you for believing in Axios. We thank the visionary executives of Cox Enterprises, led by Alex Taylor, you saw up here, for their steadfast support in building a forever company that will outlast us all. When you get this award, you are undeniably on the back nine. <laughs> but Jim and I are very grateful for this opportunity to pause and appreciate the countless people who've selflessly helped fuel and feed our passion for telling other people stuff that matters. For me, one of those was Ham Smith, a legendary journalism professor at Washington Lee University, who when you handed in foggy, meandering, throat-clearing, undergraduate, he would always emphasize, undergraduate copy, he wouldn't give you an F. He would send it back with one word at the top, nuts. <laughs> Gil Nardi, Shenandoah Valley Bureau Chief of the Richmond Times-Dispatch, who oh so patiently typed away as we talked on the phone about my very, very, very important dispatch that I was filing uh, with her. She taught me to bring the same verve and finesse to Buster the Turtle as to a gubernatorial debate. Gail was brilliant at both. Gail, thank you. I thank my dear friend and co-founder, Roy Schwartz, you had heard from earlier, without whom there would be no Axios. You see, Axios started with a radical premise, live tweeted from the bar car, of the Acela. <laughs> what if we built a news organization around what the reader wants instead of what the journalists or the publishers want? Most other news organizations are built the opposite way. How can we keep you on site? How can we build your time on site when you have no time? 
We said no. What serves the audience is knowing what's new, why it matters, with the power to go deeper. Nick Johnston is here. Brevity is confidence, length is fear. We fixated on every pixel, but that was the easy part. How do you make money? How do you make reader-first journalism sustainable? Roy cracked that code, always sticking to our North Star of elegant simplicity. And that's the magic of the partnership of Roy, Jim, and me. It's a recipe for success for you in life and work. Because absent any one of us, there's no Axios, which is a hell of a thing. And the warning for all of us, the learning for life, is to know your superpower, know your blind spot, and then find collaborators in life and work who make you a better version of yourself, which is what Roy and Jim do for me. And be yourself. When we talk about Axios journalism, we talk about trust, efficiency, which is a way of respecting the reader's intelligence, distinctiveness. Axios has never tried to be the New York Times without foreign bureaus or some organization with more of this or less of that. We've always been ourselves. How can we make smart professionals smarter, faster about what matters? And when it comes to, be, when it comes to being yourself, there's no greater role model, no one I admire more than Jim Van Dyke. From childhood, we're held back by what others think of who we are, what we wear, how we talk, how we walk, what our passions are. Jim honestly doesn't give a shit. <laughs> and that fully liberated him to be the brains, brawn, and soul of two great startups. Jim likes to say, Mickey, others have heard this, Jim likes to say, I'm impossible to offend. Behind the curtain, not totally true. <laughs> but more true than with anyone else I know. People joke that between Jim's genius and my empathy, between us, we're one whole person. <laughs> but we've learned from each other tips and tricks of life and leadership, iron sharpening iron. I'm a much better journalist, leader, and human because of Jim. America and journalists face an uncertain road. At Axios, our calling has never been more urgent the clinical and flinching pursuit of truth. Thank you, Cox. Thank you, National Press Club, for the huge honor of this award. I'm grateful to God and to my patient, supportive, loving family. Thank each of you in this room for your encouragement and your, for your vital work. And now, to rebut Jim Vanna. <laughs> that was good. The difference between Mike and I, he has all these nicely written notes, and I'm going to wing this shit. Um, <laughs> funny, uh, I have like a funny 1,000 Mike stories, but I used to joke when we were at Politico, we wanted to start a show uh, where you would give us a situation, and I would tell you why you're screwed, and he would tell you why it's the best damn thing that ever happened to you, <laughs> which captures like the essence of us. And the example I used to use is like, oh, you have terminal cancer. And I'd be like, listen, you got terminal cancer, you're going to die in two weeks, you're, you, it sucks. And Mike would be like, congratulations. This is the best news. You get to meet the Lord and experience a blissful eternal life. Awesome. <laughs> That's Mike in a hand shell. Uh, I, I will say like the... For those of us who've worked at Politico, worked at Axios, have worked with Mike, like it, like truly, of like all, I, I, I've won the lottery in life, but like being able to live and work and be best friends with a guy who is so humble, so gracious, so hardworking, it's just the coolest thing. And it's also interesting that neither of us have ever won anything alone. Like we're kind of like half good, like I'm 50% successful. <laughs> but you like put us together, like we're pretty good. We're pretty formidable. But the truth is, you guys should have given this to more than two people. It, Roy should be on this award. Roy's not a journalist, but I would argue, and I'm pretty blunt with what I think, I think he is the most formidable business thinker in Washington media in our lifetime, and it's not close. Not close. To be able to come up with a business that, be able, that can support the work that we do is an almost impossible endeavor. And without him, there's no Politico. Without him, there's no Axios. And so you should be on here. And I'm not that much of a drinker. 
Like, you make it seem like I'm a drunk, for crying out loud. We had a couple of cocktails. My God, I'm from Wisconsin. What the hell do you want me to do? But it should just be three. It should be four. If you didn't, my wife, who's not here tonight, but if she didn't give us a swift kick in the ass 17 years ago when we were going to wimp out from doing Politico, there'd be no Politico. There'd be no Axios. And four's not enough. Because all we are is like three guys with an idea and a smart business mind if we don't have people. And the number of people that have taken a flyer on us is so damn humbling over the years. Now it might be easier. 17 years ago, 18 years ago, it was hard. It was really, really hard. And so to look around at these tables and see all these people that have worked uh, with us, competed against us, but really like that worked for us. Like DJ, Danielle's here. She's worked for us, I think, five different times. We've only had two companies. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. Right, And then like people like Asia come into your life, who's only been with us now three or four years, but just add a whole new dimension to you. Like She brings organization to like our chaos. So like we're nothing without them. Swanee, who I think is one of the best journalists I've ever come across, who you saw in the video. I love Swan, but not just because he's a reporter. You saw it up there. Like He's just a good person. Like We've been so blessed with finding so many good people uh, to work with. The Cox family that's here, uh, Spencer. Uh, Sharita, Dallas, who are at this table here. You saw Alex up there. This family's believed in journalism since the late 1800s. That's before Mikey was born, right? Like the, the idea that they stay at it, that they invest in this company, that they stick with it, even when it's hard, and it's a hard damn business. It is a hard business. It is amazing. And so like the question is like, well, why? Like, why do they do that? It's because it's worth the fight. God, the Mississippi today, like what you guys did, like that, like I remember, I talked to me, like Joe Theismann used to watch Rocky to get, fired up for, uh, to get fired up for a Super Bowl. Like I hear stories like that, like that's what gets us fired up. It's what keeps us in the game. Like we're in this, like it is a fight, it is a war. And the fact that people care about that war, that they join you in that war for truth, for freedom, like it matters. It matters, like our industry, no, make no joke about it. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Like everything we do is under fire. Elon Musk sits on Twitter every day or X today saying like, we are the media, you are the media. My message to Elon Musk is bullshit. You're not the media. You having, <laughs> you having a blue check mark, a Twitter handle, in 300 words of cleverness, doesn't make you a reporter any more than me looking at your head and seeing that you have a brain and telling you have an awesome set of tools makes me a damn neurosurgeon, right? Like what we do, what journalists do, what you did in Mississippi, what Al Jazeera does in the Middle East, you don't proclaim yourself to be a reporter. Like that's nonsense. Like being a reporter is hard, really hard. You have to care. You have to do the hard work. You have to skid up every single day and say, I want to get to the closest approximation of the truth without any fear, without any favoritism. You don't do that by popping off on Twitter. You don't do that by having an opinion. You do it by doing the hard work. Take away that, that investigation. You have corruption. Like, you think about this country, like, I hate this damn debate about, like, oh, we don't need the media. Like, it is not true. Think about what makes this, I love this country. I'm a beneficiary of this country. Like, some dipshit from Wisconsin who can come and start two companies, be up here, win an award, sit next to Mikey. I'm a beneficiary of it. But there's something about the country. There's something about it, right? There's something about freedom, capitalism the animal spirits of democracy. But at the core of that is maybe transparency, maybe a free press, maybe the ability to do your job without worrying to go to jail, maybe the ability to sit in a war zone and tell people what's actually happening so they're not just looking at distortion, matters. It matters profoundly. It's why, it's not like we just love getting up at three or four in the morning doing this every single day. Like we do it because we love it. We do it because it matters. The work that we do matters. I don't think people at Mississippi today are sitting there like, oh, I'm going to do this for the prestige and the massive paycheck. I don't know what you make, but I know not-for-profits don't pay a ton. You do it because you care, because it makes a difference. And I think that that's where you should end the night. Like, listen, like every day, 
We're in a fight. You, me, we got to remind young journalists. We got to remind the American people. Hell, I think we have to remind ourselves that you got to get up every day and say, how can I be just a little bit better? How can I be just a little more fearless? How can I write a little more crisply? How can I report a little more deeply so that I can inform people? How can you do your part every day to get those people who've grown deeply skeptical of the work that we all do to be less skeptical, to believe in the work that you do? How can you get up, and maybe it's not your job, but figure out that this is a hard business? Maybe pay attention to the difficulties in running a business, and how can you help contribute to figuring out how we create business models to make journalism viable, to make journalism scalable? That's been the beauty of our journey. It really has. I love journalism. What do I do for fun? I write. I love it. Like, why do we write a column while running a co company? Because I love this stuff. I think it's really important. I think we know a lot. I want to be able to tell people that. But the coolest thing is somehow we've been able to figure out how to turn these things into businesses. And that's not a bad word. We all need to figure that out. Because if you lose... What is a journalist in 2024? Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about journalists in 2024. Once upon a time, journalism meant a guy with a notepad, a trench coat, and the scent of stale coffee chasing a breaking story. Today, it's an influencer named Our Sassy Scoop posting a TikTok about why avocado toast is the reason the economy is in shambles. Ah, uh, progress. Journalism has evolved or devolved, depending on your perspective. Now, anyone with Wi-Fi and a ring light thinks they're Woodward and Bernstein, but instead of uncovering Watergate, they're uncovering 15 ways billionaires control your zodiac sign. Groundbreaking. Social media. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Social media has turned journalism into a gladiator sport. On one hand, it's beautiful. Citizen journalists are live-streaming revolutions, holding corrupt leaders accountable, and exposing injustices in real time. On the other hand, some dude named Chad in his mom's basement is reporting on how lizard people control the government, using screenshots from Shrek as evidence. Both are treated with equal credibility because, hey, they've got blue check marks, and let's not forget the algorithms. They're like the Hunger Games for news, prioritizing clickbait like you'll never believe what Trump said about bagels over actual reporting. Because, you know, who needs investigative journalism when you can have a BuzzFeed quiz on what type of bread are you? The new journalist, the multi-hyphenate hustler. In 2024, being a journalist means wearing many hats. You're a writer, a videographer, a meme creator, and occasionally a barista, because freelance doesn't pay the rent. You're chasing clicks, likes, and shares, while dodging trolls who call you fake news for using big words like context. And can we talk about the ethics? Journalists used to pride themselves on integrity. Now it's, I'll write about your multi-level marketing scheme for exposure. Just... Tag me on Instagram. Investigative reporting. That's cute. Real reporters are out here hosting podcast adjacent mukbangs while debating climate change. But there's hope. Kind of despite all this, good journalism still exists. There are real reporters out there risking their lives to tell the truth. They're not getting likes or shares. They're getting jailed or worse. Meanwhile, the rest of us are doom-scrolling sharing memes about how 2024 is the worst season of America yet. So what's the takeaway? Journalism in 2024 is messy, hilarious, and occasionally horrifying. But here's the serious bit. In a world drowning in noise, real journalism matters more than ever. It's not just about the hottest take or the snazziest TikTok. It's about truth, and that, my friends is something worth fighting for, even if it doesn't go viral.